All right, good morning. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to tell you how to get topology hiding computation on all graphs. But first, let's talk a little bit about Facebook. Facebook is great. It connects millions of people all over the world with their friends and families and co-authors. Uh, allows you to exchange messages, tell them how you're doing, what you're doing, your likes, your dislikes, as long as all of that information goes through Facebook. In this model, Facebook is a trusted third party, and using Facebook, uh, it can compute functions on your personal data and the, the social graph of, of friends that you have. At the price of uh, Facebook knowing all of your personal data and all of your friends. And this is, for example, why one of our co-authors doesn't use Facebook. So what if we wanted to get a decentralized social network? That way I could talk to one of my co-authors over Facebook. No. Um, so in this model, we no longer have a trusted third party. Your friends can talk to, you can talk to your friends, your friends can talk back to you, um, and you get privacy both for your personal information and for the social graph, so you don't need to reveal who all your friends are to anyone else. Now you might be thinking, wait, we already have something that does this. We get privacy for your data with uh, multi-party computation studied in the 80s, and the setting is you have multiple parties, each with their own private inputs, uh, who jointly want to compute a function without revealing anything beyond the output of that function. However, the setting for MPC has the communication topology being public, meaning you're either dealing with a complete graph where every party can talk to every other party, or if you have an incomplete communication graph, uh, it's public and everyone knows who's talking to whom. So MPC does nothing to hide any of the metadata of the computation that goes on. And unfortunately, metadata is a very powerful tool. As the former director of the NSA once said, you can kill people based on metadata. The idea is you can infer a lot from who's talking to whom. And that leads us to our goal. We want to get topology hiding computation. Topology hiding computation is a kind of multi-party computation that hides both the input and the communication graph. It is good for this uh, social network example. Um, there are many applications, and another application is uh, maybe you have a vehicular network where when cars are close to each other, they can communicate and um, disperse information about traffic patterns, hazards, weather on the highway, but maybe you don't want to reveal where you are relative to other cars in this network. So more formally, the setting for topology hiding computation, yeah, each party has their own in input for a function, and parties can communicate directly only with their neighbors. Our goal will be given minimal information about the graph, maybe a bound on the diameter of the the graph or the number of nodes, uh, we want to be able to compute any function on the inputs while revealing nothing beyond the output. And this includes revealing no more information about the graph. To formally uh, define this, like the security of this uh, model, we say that an adversary who statically corrupts uh, some set of nodes can't tell if he's interacting with a real graph or if he's interacting with a simulated graph. Um, that, so the simulator knows the output of the function, and it knows the local topology of uh, the adversarially corrupted nodes. Notice the simulator doesn't have an edge between nodes one and two, because he doesn't know that exists, and node six isn't in the simulated graph, because the adversary can't tell that that node exists. Okay, this seems difficult. Is this even possible? Well, it turns out, instead of having to prove that we can get any function at all in this model, it's enough to prove that we can get topology hiding broadcast. Um, so our goal is going to be to get broadcast. Uh, so the, the setting is, um, let's consider a naive broadcast to demonstrate this. We have a broadcast node, node two here, who's got a broadcast bit and wants to let everyone in the graph know the broadcast bit. So in the first round, nodes one and three get the broadcast bit. In the next round, one and three send the bit to their neighbors who get the broadcast bit. And then finally, uh, node six gets the broadcast bit from, from her neighbors. This is not topology hiding for the reason that it reveals the distance to the broadcaster. 
As soon as uh, one and three get their message in the first round, they know their distance one from the broadcaster. These guys know their distance two, and node six knows she's distance three away. So it, it turns out that this is even harder than, we, uh, than, than that. Uh, it's impossible to get topology hiding computation against any kind of, uh, almost any kind of active adversary. Like, uh, say your adversary just has the power to abort, to stop communicating or communication from, through his node. Um, in 2015, Moran, Orlovin, Richelson showed that against a fail-stop adversary, a topology hiding broadcast is impossible, and they did this just by showing that if you have um, an adversary, like this middle adversary here, who can stop working and disconnect the graph, then this reveals something about the topology of the, of the graph. However, the good news is we, we can get some results. We already have some results on, uh, against passive adversaries. Um, so in 2015 and 2016, uh, there were results on getting topology hiding broadcast on small diameter graphs. And then earlier this year, Akevian Moran showed that you could get topology hiding broadcast on some large diameter graphs, including chains, cycles, and trees. But the question remained open. Is topology hiding computation possible for all graphs? Well, I wouldn't be standing here <laughs> if the answer wasn't yes, it is. And that brings us to our formal results. So assuming that uh, decisional Diffie-Hellman is hard, topology hiding broadcast is feasible for all graphs. Um, explicitly, our contribution, uh, so the akevia moran protocol showed that given DDH, um, we can get this thing called or homomorphic privately key commutative randomizable encryption. And then we show that this gets us topology hiding broadcast for all graphs. Now let's focus in on this or part here. So or implies broadcast. So we're, instead of just going straight for broadcast, we're going to show actually how to compute the or of a bunch of bits on a graph. So this works because uh, the output bit is actually equal to the or of the output bit with a bunch of zeros. Great, so the source node is going to have his output bit, all other nodes are going to have zeros, and if at the end of the computation everyone gets the or of the output bit, you will have broadcasted that bit. So our goal will be to compute that. However, note that naive oring is not topology hiding, that is if you, you know, just try broadcasting your bit to your neighbors and then oring the bits you get in return. You run into the same problem that you did with naive broadcast. If the output bit is one, you know exactly when you receive that output bit. So we're going to need these, uh, these tools. The first tool is we need our encryption scheme to be or homomorphic. So you have uh, two encrypted bits and you need to be able to homomorphically or them to get there to get the encryption of two of the or of those bits. Moreover, we need to hide the number of times we've ORed a one or a zero. Even if you can decrypt the message, you shouldn't be able to tell. That is, an encryption of a one needs to look just like an encryption of a one ORed with a zero homomorphically, it needs to look just like an encryption of a one ORed with a one homomorphically. Turns out, you can get this just using Elgamal. All right, this brings to mind the following construction. What if we just uh, tried the naive oring protocol, but now we encrypted our bits first and then uh, ORed them as, as we went along? Well, we run into the problem that this doesn't quite work because how do you decrypt at the end? You, you, you run into the problem of uh, who has the secret key? Uh, how do you get the secret key to everyone else in the graph? So we need one more um, property for our encryption scheme. And that is where this privately key commutative randomizable encryption comes in. Notice I have a picture of an onion on the screen. That is because we will be able to add layers of public keys and delete layers of public keys. Okay, how do you add layers to an onion? Maybe it's more of a parfait. <laughs> I digress. So. When we add a layer, what, what, are we, what, are we, what are we doing? We have um, an encrypted message under one public key, and then we have a secret key that is uh, unrelated. So we have a message encrypted under the blue public key and a yellow secret key. And using this, we can 
add a, a yellow public key layer to our message. This uh, image might be a little bit misleading. We're not re-encrypting an already encrypted message. We're actually multiplying the two public keys together. So what this actually is doing is uh, producing a message that looks like it's encrypted, or actually is encrypted under the uh, product of the two public keys. Now when you delete a layer, you're just doing this process in reverse. You have your encrypted uh, message that's got this layered property, and you have a secret key corresponding to one of those public keys, and then you can just remove that layer. Great. This is also possible using Elgamal. So now that we have both of these two tools, uh, we're ready to go for, through a warm-up protocol before getting to our actual protocol for all graphs. So I'm going to discuss the uh, Akivya Moran protocol on getting or on uh, cycle graphs. So there are going to be two phases. The first phase is a forward phase where we're going to add layers going one way around the graph. The next phase is a backwards phase where we're going to remove layers going back around the other way on the graph. Let's focus on uh, how node one is going to get the correct output bit. So in round one, node one is going to encrypt his bit and then send it to node two. Node two, round two, is going to generate a new public secret key pair, add a layer, homomorphically, homomorphically or her own bit, and then send this resulting message to node three. Node three does the same thing. A new public secret key pair, adds a layer, or is his own bit, homomorphically, sends this to node four. All right, we get the idea, hopefully. Um, oh, node 4 adds a layer, or is his bit, sends it to node 5. Node 5 doesn't need uh, to add another layer, it just needs to homomorphically or his own bit. And now we have encrypted up here the output bit. And now we can begin the backwards phase and start going back around the graph. Hopefully you see where this is going. So node 5 sends this entire message back to node 4. Node 4 uses the red secret key to remove the red layer, sends this back to node three. Node three uses his light blue secret key to remove that layer, sends it back to node two, who removes a layer, sends it back to node one. Now node one has the corresponding secret key here. So node one decrypts the message and now has, in plain text, the or of all bits in the graph. Great. Well, node one has the output bit. We now need to make sure that every other node in the graph also gets the output bit. This isn't too hard. We'll just run the same protocol simultaneously for each node. So correctness of the protocol. In round one, everyone you know, sends their bit to their neighbors. Uh, run the protocol for every node. Every node is going to get the output bit at the end. To argue topology hiding uh, of this protocol, um, first we have to note that you know, everyone knows they're in a cycle. So what are you hiding? you're hiding the order of the nodes in the cycle. And you can see this intuitively because of the semantic security of the encryption, means you can't tell when you get a one or a zero, and the re-randomization, the adding of the new public keys, mean that each node's view is indistinguishable from any other node's view. Great, so our work is going to essentially extend this whole like adding layers and oring protocol. The Akavia Moran protocol uh, had this observation that if you had a path that covered the graph, your protocol would be correct. So instead of taking a prescribed path around the graph, we're just going to take a random walk. And as long as a random walk covers the graph, we'll be fine. We can hit the same node more than once. This won't matter because oring a bit twice is, isn't going to change the output at all. Um, and as long as every node runs a random walk, every node will get the output bit at the end. So this brings the following protocol to mind. Every node is just going to start a random walk, and um, by, as long as it runs long enough, every random walk will cover the graph, and every node will get the output bit. This will not be enough for the following reason. So let's say, let's focus on node three. So let's say uh, every one of node three's neighbors decides to start the random walk by sending a message to node three. 
Node three, being a diligent node, is randomly, independently going to decide where those walks are going to go next. Well, now we have a problem. Nodes two and seven have now learned that node three has another neighbor other than themselves. Node four has learned that node three has two other neighbors. And node five has even learned something probabilistically about the number of neighbors node three has. So this is also not topology hiding. So to fix this, if you look at the title of the slide, we're going to use correlated random walks, and we're, we're going to make sure that the graph topology doesn't affect how many messages go along each edge. So we're going to have one walk per direction on each edge. This will be clear, hopefully, in a moment. So to correlate the walks, node three is going to get messages from all his neighbors, walks from all of his neighbors, and then he's going to generate a fresh random permutation and then of, of his edges, he's going to permute those messages around to decide where to send them next, and then he's going to send those out. He gets one message in on each edge, one message out, and sends one message out on each of his edges. And as long as you invert the permutations on the way back, uh, the protocol is still going to be correct. Now, speaking of uh, correctness, we have to make sure that the random walks don't actually take too long. Um, to do that, uh, we're going to talk about the cover time of a graph G. The cover time of a graph is the maximum expected time it takes to visit all nodes in a graph using a random walk. And we have this convenient upper bound of uh, 4n cubed on the cover time of uh, any graph on n nodes. So this means if we take about n to the four steps, we will cover the, any random walk will cover the graph with overwhelming probability. And so we prove correctness for all of the random walks in our graph, uh, just with a union bound. And so we have correctness of our algorithm. Let's uh, finish with some security. So let's focus again on node three. Node three gets encrypted messages from its neighbors every round. He can't tell if he's getting a zero or a one because of semantic security. Um, because he's doing all of this permuting of, of uh, the messages, everyone else is doing permuting, uh, re-randomization, adding a public key, he can't tell where any of those messages have been. For example, he can't tell if the message he got from node seven came from eight or from node six. And this means node three can't tell if he's interacting with a real graph or, if a sim or with a simulator who only knows the output bit and the local information of node 3's neighbors. So in the forward phase of, of the walks, the simulator just sends encryptions of zero through, through three. And in the backwards phase, uh, the simulator just sends encryptions of the output bit. And by the end of uh, the protocol, node 3 gets the output bit as expected. Now to uh, one, one more. Fun little note here is that we can de-randomize the walks. Um, this is interesting because it get, brings us one step closer to getting a perfectly correct topology hiding algorithm. Um, I say one step because unfortunately, uh, we have negligible error both in the walks and in the uh, homomorphically um, secure encryption scheme. The Elgamal is, has a negligible pro probability of failing. So, we have our universal explorer up here, and uh, we're going to be using something called a universal exploration sequence to de-randomize these walks. A universal exploration sequence is just a set, for, for graphs of size n, is just a set of instructions such that if you follow them for a walk, you're guaranteed to hit every node in the graph, any graph of size n. And the best part about these walks is that they're all relative to position and locally computable. So every node, in the graph can compute the same set of uh, instructions, the same universal exploration sequence. All right, I'm going to conclude with a couple of open questions. So it is impossible to get topology hiding computation if the adversary can disconnect the graph, but what if we don't allow the adversary to disconnect the graph, but we still let him deviate from the protocol in some way? Then there's also the question of uh, dynamic graphs in the example where you have cars on a highway communicating locally with each other. Uh, you always have cars entering the highway and leaving the highway, so the graph is going to be changing, but not adversarially. And finally, 
here is a slide reviewing the algorithm. Um, I think we've got some questions. <laughs>